Now we've been talking a lot about groups and deviance and how we attribute things and our attitudes and an important attitude that we discuss in social psychology is the notion of prejudice. And so how we're defining prejudice about this, prejudice is different from racism. And we'll talk more about racism and sexism later on. But prejudice is really the idea of prejudging someone, having ideas about them that are not founded in fact, or not entirely founded in fact. And the way we prejudge other people really plays out in the us versus them dichotomy that we build in our brain. One eminent social psychologist who really proposed this theory was Henry Tajvel. And Henry Tajvel believed that the way we think about people in our group versus people in other groups is very different. For instance, when we think about people in our group, also called in-group perception, we tend to see people as individuals. If you think about people in your class when you have classes in person, or people in your neighborhood, or people in your family, then you tend to see the nuances and uniqueness of each individual. You may say, yeah, my whole family is the same religion, but we all have different opinions about that religion. Or my whole family is of this culture, but the way we connect to that culture is a little bit different. Or we might argue about different cultural things. And so when you think about people in your group, you see them for who they are. You see their unique personalities, their unique experiences, and you see them all as individuals rather than as one monolithic group. So the in-group perception allows us to see the exceptions. For instance, perhaps you belong to a cultural group that's often stereotyped. You understand that yeah, sometimes a stereotype works, but a lot of times it doesn't. And you understand all the nuances and exceptions to the rule within your in-group experience. In-group perception can also lend itself to tribalism. And tribalism is something that is pretty hardwired into all of us. And it goes back until very early human history. And it's the idea that we lived in tribes. And in order to protect yourself and stay alive, you had to protect the tribe. So you protected people that were in your group. This is hardwired into us. And it's the idea that you're going to have a strong preference and you're going to prioritize those people that are in your group. You want to protect the people that go to the same place of worship as you. You want to protect the people that live in your building or protect the people that are from your hometown. You feel this brotherhood with them or they feel like they're your kin or they're your brethren and you owe them something. And so this protection and bonding is important. It, again, has kept us alive for many years. We can see this played in modern society when you feel a lot of tribalism towards your team. And so it might be the idea that regardless of what sports team you root for, you feel very passionate about your team. The players might switch out. The players are not actually from that city, but you still feel a lot of preference for that team. Or it's the idea that you feel a lot of national pride and someone who comes from the same hometown or the same country as you, you're rooting for them. Or if someone from the same cultural or heritage background as you becomes rich and famous and they're in a movie, it fills you with pride. You feel like the community as a whole is winning in some way. So the idea if there's a new Marvel Avenger who represents your demographic group, you're, you're going to feel a little bit happy about that, a little bit special about that because it's really cool. It's also the idea of somebody with your sexual orientation or gender identity becomes famous. It makes you feel more validated. Where this can go wrong, of course, it can go to extremes, to nepotism. And this is the idea where you're preferencing and prioritizing to someone who doesn't deserve it. So this is the idea you give someone a job because they know someone in your network, even if they're not qualified for the job, or you overlook other qualified candidates. So that's when it goes to an extreme, but most of us use non-extreme forms of tribalism every day. And it helps us to foster a social bonds, foster a sense of community. It's also the idea if you're in a new city and you spot a restaurant that serves the type of food you used to eat when you were a kid, you're just going to feel a little bit more positive towards them. You're going to have that explicit attitude where you feel more comfortable there. And that's totally legit. So the in-group stuff's usually pretty good. However, when it compares to the out-group perceptions, this is when we see the problem. Although in in-group, we can see everyone for individuals, when we look at groups outside of ours, we tend to just view the group similarities. Let's say you're not a rugby player and you don't know much about rugby players, but you know a few individuals on the rugby team. You might not really even see them as individuals. You might see them as a glossy, broad brushstroke of a person. And that's because when you think about the rugby team as a group, you might use some generalities. You might say, oh, I heard the rugby players like to drink beer. All rugby players must like beer or they eat steak. All rugby players must like to eat steak. And so you might think they're rough, they're tough, and that's really where it ends off. 
we do this a lot within groups that we don't know about. If you don't know individuals who work in oil and gas, if you don't know people that work in the cod fisheries, if you don't know people who live in Quebec or who are from British Columbia, you might make broad generalities about what you think those people are like. And these broad generalities are the stereotypes. We'll talk a little bit more about stereotypes in just a moment. But how these stereotypes form is really by othering that other group. So the outgroup perception is really constructed through othering. So defining others and othering is the idea of defining people that your bubble doesn't extend to. Defining people who are different from you. So this is the idea that we will find more outgroup perceptions and we will find more stereotypes when it comes to people who are different from us in terms of their ethnicity, their religion, their income level, the country of origin or the province of origin or their politics even. And so it becomes much easier for us to generalize and to not see the nuances and individuality and exceptions when people are different from us. When we, when we can find something that makes someone dissimilar to us. When we think about someone who's similar to us, someone who has the same religion as us or the same ethnicity as us, we tend to think about the complexities and we understand, well, not everybody with our skin tone is the same and not everybody with our religion is the same. But when we think about other skin tones and other religions and other political viewpoints, we tend to think all individuals are the same. And this can lead us down the hall into xenophobia. And xenophobia is the idea that we're wary of the unknown. This ignorance is what causes fear, which is what causes hate. And so xenophobia is we dislike things that are similar to our way of being. We want things the way we have them. So xenophobia is when you're not sure how to handle things that are different. And xenocentric is the idea you actually have a preference for your viewpoint. This is sort of tribalism on steroids. And this is the idea that instead of just liking people that are similar to you, you start to feel more wary or not as warm or not as friendly with people that are dissimilar to you. You still might try to be an ally, but it's the idea you're a little bit of a hesitant ally. You're a little bit uncomfortable in your allyship and that you don't quite understand what other people are going through. Now it's important to understand, everyone can experience xenophobia regardless of if they are a historically privileged or historically marginalized group. And so regardless of your demographic, you can feel xenophobia towards other groups. And so an example of this would be, let's say you want to have a potluck at work and you say, hey, can everyone bring a different type of sandwich? I was a sandwich. I don't like to eat sandwiches for lunch. I like to eat ribs or I like to eat noodles or I like to eat salads. You say, what? That's not something we want to have at the potluck. How are you going to share a salad? And so it's the idea that you grew up sharing sandwiches at potlucks and now other people want to do things different and that's different to you and it feels uncomfortable and you have a preference for the ways you're used to it. It's important to understand xenophobia and tribalism are both hardwired into us Everybody does them to some extent, but may not be fully conscious of it. And some people, when they become conscious of it, they actively try and account for that and work against it. Now you can imagine with these outgroup perceptions and with othering of others, we can start to form stereotypes. So what is a stereotype? Well, a stereotype is a perceived probability. Sometimes these are based somewhat in truth, but sometimes these are completely fabricated and completely fictional. And so a stereotype is the idea that it's easier for you to process information with shortcuts. And a stereotype is a cognitive shortcut. It's the idea when you start to see a pattern, whether it's fabricated or not, you will use that shortcut to make a generality about a group. And so this is the idea you say, oh, okay, so everybody from British Columbia does this versus everyone from PEI does that. And it's easier for you to kind of say, okay, this is how I remember those two provinces. We automatically make stereotypes. It's something our brain has been set up to do since infancy. And some stereotypes are helpful, but a lot of them are not. And especially they're not if they're completely fabricated, if they're hateful, and if they're discriminatory, they're going to be problems. However, even when they're not hateful and discriminatory, some stereotypes just block out counter evidence and they ignore the nuances, complexity, and diversity of the human experience. They make us not see the truth a lot of the time. And so even if they're pretty pleasant or pretty benign, they can be harmful in the long term because we're not getting the full picture. Now, there's lots of harmful stereotypes we could talk about. I'm going to try and stay away from those ones. But let's go into a more benign stereotype, and that is lots of Canadian stereotypes. We have many of them, that we wear flannel and plaid, we like to play hockey, there's polar bears in our backyard, we drink maple syrup three times a day, we like the cold, or it's always cold here, and we live in snow igloos. These are pretty intense stereotypes. Now, 
some of these stereotypes are not completely fabricated. Some of them are based in truth. We do have a lot of great hockey in Canada and hockey is a really cool pastime here. We do have a lot of maple syrup production in Canada and I personally enjoy maple syrup. But could you imagine if you used the stereotype literally? If when you first met a Canadian, you assumed that they must like hockey and they must have seen polar bears in the backyard. Sure, it might not be hateful, it might not be discriminatory, but it's actually a pretty reductionistic viewpoint of human diversity. We know there are many Canadians who don't like hockey and don't play hockey and who have never skated. We know there's some Canadians that actually don't prefer maple syrup. Might come as a shock to some of us, but it is possible. And we know there's some parts of Canada that don't even grow maple leaves. Calgary and Alberta being one of the areas where we don't have maple leaves, for instance. And so using these broad strokes is problematic. And if you think about more hateful or more discriminatory stereotypes, it becomes even more of a problem. The big problem with stereotypes is they box us in. They assume that you can cleanly categorize people. And we know that categories don't work. Most of us are unique and on distributions, if anything. Another problem that stereotypes lead to is our implicit prejudice. Often, we consciously and explicitly don't believe the stereotype. But implicitly, it influences how we think. And what happens here is we might say, you know, I believe men and women should be equal. Or I know lots of nice Americans and lots of angry Canadians, so I know the stereotype is false. But implicitly, the way our brain thinks about stereotypes, you know, who's friendlier, Canadians or Americans, it tends to shape our thinking. And so Anthony Greenwald created a psychological test to test for this implicit prejudice. And what this was is through the implicit association test. Now the implicit association test requires someone to sit at a computer and use two keys on the keypad. I think it's usually an E and an I on the QWERTY layout. So you have one on the left side, one on the right side. And on your monitor, you would see things happening on the left side of the monitor and things happening on the right side of the monitor. And what often happens here is you had to match them. And there is one example of Canadian and American implicit bias, so I'll use it. And it's the idea that it goes through randomized trials. In one set of trials, Canada might be matched with positive words and America might be matched with negative words. And then it switches with Canada matched with negative words and American matched with positive words. Some people might get one trial first versus other people might get the other type of trial first. And you have to tap the E and the I when things match certain ways. And so the condition will ask you first to match, let's say, Canada and bad words and America and good words. And you have to try and click the ones that match as fast as you can. And then it'll switch which way it goes. So if you start off matching Canada to negative adjectives, then you'll match Canada to positive adjectives. And what the IAT test has determined is people with certain implicit prejudice, people whose brains have been conditioned to adhere to certain stereotypes, will answer some patterns faster than others. For instance, myself, when I complete the IAT, I answer and match Canada to more positive attributes much faster than I match Canada to more negative attributes. It's much more difficult for me to do that. And so this is the idea that my brain is set up to view my, my country positively. And my brain is set up to be somewhat nationalistic and somewhat patriotic and that I'm going to match Canada with more positive attributes. There's lots of variations on this test, of course, matching people based on their gender, based on their body weight, based on their skin tone. And so finding out that individuals who even say they are not racist, they might process lighter skin tones with positive words more fast than they process dark skin tones with positive words. And so even though explicitly they believe in racial equality, implicitly their brain has been conditioned to internalize the stereotype and to function faster. It's the idea that when you match something the opposite of the stereotype you believe in, you actually have to inhibit your brain and, and pause the synapses, and it takes you a little bit longer to respond to it. Now, this is a very controversial test, and a lot of people argue about whether it's valid or not, but there are many people who agree in the validity and many people who attack the validity. You'll get a chance to fill it out in D2L and try it for yourself, and I'll let you make your own decision on how you feel about this. The important thing as a scientist is always to be tentative and open to new criticisms and open to new changes as we move forward as a discipline. And the last type of stereotype we're going to talk about is the self-fulfilling prophecy. This is a special stereotype and it's about yourself. And what happens here is if somebody calls you a name from a very young age, if somebody calls you a bad kid or a smart kid or a picky eater or dumb or angry, we tend to make a narrative about those things and internalize them. 
And it's just the idea that just being aware of stereotypes will help us to follow those stereotypes. So if somebody tells you that your gender is not as good at math or your gender is more passive or people from your ethnic group are more likely to argue about money, it's going to make you follow that. And so even discourses which are critical of stereotypes can actually accidentally enforce stereotypes. Just by discussing how problematic stereotypes are in university, we're making more people be aware of them and then we might make people accidentally and unconsciously follow them. So the self-fulfilling prophecy is something we can see play out in young childhood. If you tell a child they're smart or you tell a child they're not smart, they will follow that script accordingly. It is something that if you become conscious of, you can take ownership over and can readjust, but most of the time we don't. Most of the time we just follow it. So this really plays an important role. And as a developmental psychologist, I really have to emphasize, never tell your child they're bad. Always tell them they're smart and good uh, because it actually does make a difference.